Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net and today I've got the pleasure of introducing a new addition to the OCL team. This is Dr. I am Danny Kopeck. And so for those of y'all who are unfamiliar with Dr. Kopeck's body of work, let's take it all the way back to 1980. He won the Scottish Championship. He was awarded the IM title in 1985. Uh, this man's got a PhD in machine intelligence, and uh, he's very well known for his contributions to opening theory, specifically the COPEX system. Uh, just really quick, I'm going to show this on my screen here. Uh, the COPEX system starting against the Sicilian with this three bishop d3. And so if you guys want to look that up, the ECO code for the COPEX system, I believe, is B50, B51, and B52. So how's everything going today, Danny? Oh, wonderful. It's a pleasure to join your team, Will, and I look forward to working with you. All right. Well, excellent, man. So uh, let's go ahead and kick things off here. So we wanted to uh, highlight one of uh, the memorable, the many memorable uh, games in, in Dr. Kopeck's career. And so we're going to start by looking at a game from uh, one of Dr. Kopeck's best uh, and most popular DVDs, the Middle Game Pawn Play DVD, I believe this is from part one. This was a correspondence game that Dr. Kopeck played over three years with a Ostein Lorenzen, a uh, very strong correspondence player around 2450, something like that. And uh, well, let's go ahead and kick things off today, Danny. So in this game, you were playing white, and the opening started fairly normal, you know, nothing too crazy here. And so you opened with this bishop g5 move, he played c5, uh, e3, nothing too crazy. And uh, things started getting interesting in the opening. Uh, yeah, you know, he castled kind of early, nothing, nothing too nuts yet. And so with this move, six, knight to e5. This is a pretty e5. strange move. What, what did you start thinking here? Kind of what, what were you thinking uh, about, you know, when he played knight to d5 like this, um, this is definitely diverging from normal stuff. I mean, what, what, kind of, what kind of things were you thinking about to take advantage of this? Well, uh, actually, there were some postcards that, uh, you know, went back and forth with this. And, uh, you know, any information you can get about your opponent, whether it's during a tournament game or through correspondence, you know, tournament over the board, or correspondence game can be helpful to you. And he revealed his thinking when on the next move I played h4 and he thought that he'd never seen any move like this. And I thought I'd never seen a move like knight d5, taking a piece away from your king, moving it twice in the opening like this. So we both had kind of different views of chess and that was apparent through the little exchange of comments in the postcards. And uh, now uh, he went, it was clear to me, from the next move and much of what you'll see in the next segment of play, that he's very, very materialistic, my opponent. He may be very strong, but he's also very materialistic. And uh, bear in mind, this is the time when computers were starting to come into play in chess and, and correspondence chess, and computers are also very materialistic. So he plays f6, and it's clear that if I play bishop f4, he's going to just take on f4 and then take on d4, and he's going to have a pretty good game. Okay, that that's my center's disappeared somewhat, and there are no immediately winning sacrifices like bishop takes h7, so I didn't want to allow that. So okay. we go back. Yeah, so going so, back here, so after f6, you know, what's white going to do here? I mean, uh, you know, in poker they'd say you're pretty pot committed. With h4, you're, you're, going, uh, you're going for broke here. So, you know, how, how can white uh, try to mix things up a little more? Well, he has to counter punch, which is what I consider myself. c4, hit that knight. On, C, on D5 and, you know, take away its comfort. And, you know, we'll trade that bishop and open the H file. If he takes it, we'll take with the pawn. 
and the knight will be hanging, and we'll threaten bishop takes h7 check, just for example. Okay? So if he plays pawn takes g5, we'll play h takes g5 in this position, and we're threatening both the knight and bishop takes h7 check, for example. And a variation here that could quickly lead to mate would be knight b4, bishop takes h7 check, king f7, knight e5 check, and mate follows. Okay, so I think that's going to illustrate pretty well. And what I liked about this game was a couple things. First of all, we see black kind of breaks a rule in the opening as far as moving one of your pieces twice before you've completed your development. This knight d5 move was definitely pretty, uh, it was pretty weird. And the follow-up with f6, okay, this, this was actually pretty logical. It was kind of like, Knight d5, he wanted to trade pieces, you played h4, now he follows with f6, and now, uh, you know, in a blitz game, this kind of stuff flies, right? But in a correspondence game where you got all day to analyze, sacrificing a piece like this with unclear complications is kind of a different story. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, one of the points also, you know, I mean, he says that he, you know, I think his implication was that h4 was a coffee house move. Well, but it was it was necessary too. You know, he, he said he never saw such a move. Maybe not in correspondence chess, but certainly you see it in blitz and attacking chess. <laughs> so anyway, now uh, he played knight b4, I believe. Yeah, that's got to be the only move, right? I mean, uh, if he takes your bishop, you know, as you just uh, we just looked at, you know, that opens up the rook on the h file. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have time to move the knight to b6 or c7. There's too many sacrifices hanging over his king. And if he retreats with the knight, I guess you just have something simple. Maybe you don't even have to sacrifice. You could play queen c2 or bishop f4, and it just seems too easy for white. Yeah, you have a huge game. You have a huge game. So much development and development with tempo. One of the themes that I, I feel this game illustrates, and by the way, it's fully annotated in my new book, uh, called Practical Middle Game Techniques, second edition, uh, it's completely annotated, is the theme of jump development. You don't just develop, your pieces jump into the game, and a move like Queen C2 is just that. You know, you're making a developing move and a threat. And I, I don't think he still would dare taking take the bishop on G5, but what else is going to do now? So knight b6 is out of the question. So knight b4. And now, an easy move for me to play is bishop to b1, which is what I played. And he plays a smart move. He takes on d4. And this shows, this demonstrates to me that he's alert. And I'll, the analysis would go something like this. If uh, after C takes D4, if he taken first on G5, then we would have a winning attack with Bishop takes H7 check, King takes H7, Knight G5 check, and if Bishop takes Knight, Pawn takes G5 check, King G8, Queen H5, and it's pretty much over with g6 to follow. g6 first, and then it's mate. And it's pretty hard for black to stop that, and also uh, not lose his queen. Now he does have knight d3 check, but that really doesn't change anything. Knight d3 check, king e2, and basically the same themes that I'm talking about are there. g6, queen h Eight check or there, and it, nothing changes. Mate is imminent. So, going back, this little in-between move before he takes the bishop on g5 makes a huge difference because he wins the f4 square because I recapture. And now, if he takes on g5, as we just looked at, he will indeed be able to defend because bishop takes, king takes, knight takes. If he goes back, queen h5, king back, queen h5. And now he has knight d3 check 
And if king f1, king f1, king f1, rook takes f2 check, king g1, rook takes g2 check with the knight fork on f4. So you see how important the f4 square is. And if the king goes to b1 after knight d3 check, Back one move, please. Not sure. knight c2, but knight f4 is also pretty winning. Knight f4, knight f2 should also win. Everything should win. Okay. So, uh, so back back to the continuation of the game, right? So that's that's gonna you know pretty much show why c takes d4. You know he had to throw that in there. A little accurate, uh, accurate move order, uh, trying to uh, set up a nice little sneaky defense with the knight on f4. Exactly. And so now he feels comfortable taking my bishop on g5. And here I'm thinking about moves like a a3. But I decided, as per Leonid Shemkovich's book, where he talks about real sacrifices, the, la the late Grandmaster Leonid Shemkovich, he talks about real sacrifices where, versus what he played on his name, he called them sham sacrifices. And I decided that now this game's going to be a real sacrifice, not a sham sacrifice. I'm going to play down a piece. And we've only played 10 moves, okay, and I'm down a piece already. That's pretty bad. And uh, I simply take back. H takes G5. But the threat is pretty serious. Bishop takes h7 check, knight e5 check, etc. With the queen, bishop, rook, all conglomerating on the black king. And I'm also wondering what, what he's going to do, you know? And being ultra-materialistic here is what he demonstrates he is. So that's why it's, it's, a, it's a real sacrifice. And before I make any further uh, attacking attempts, I want to test whether I'm playing a human or a computer here. And that's why I play a3. It's not only for that reason. But I play a3 because I think a human might recognize that the knight on a6 is truly out of the game for a very long time. And the knight on c6, even though... It doesn't have much to do. It's better to possibly give back a piece and get, you know, into the game than to just sit on a6 doing nothing, as you'll see for the rest of this game. But now I thought a very long time. And, you know, in real correspondence chess, you can think about three weeks. I mean, the cycle can be a long one, and you're allowed an average of three days per move. And I know I spent a fairly long time on the next move because it was a very difficult move to play. And I was looking for rook takes h7, queen h5 check, but the queen can't jump over the knight, can't get in. And if you play rook takes, king takes, knight e5, he can play rook f5. That was a key defensive move I had to deal with throughout the game. And then if g4, he goes rook takes g5, and everything gets kind of messy and unclear. Okay? So I didn't want to deal with that. And yet, here on move 13, I just had sacrificed a piece. I sacrificed a second piece. Now remember, this is correspondence chess. So if you're going to be down two pieces, you better have something, whether or not your opponent is defending with a computer or not. And I'm convinced that he did use a computer, because at every choice point in this game, he made the most materialistic move. Bishop takes g6, and that's what computers do. H takes g6, knight e5. But it's also great to be able to play a quiet move, relatively speaking, like this, two pieces down. And it's like as if white and black are in two different worlds in this game. 
White is attacking like mad on the king's side, and black is enjoying half a chess set on the queen's side that's not developed. And his king is kind of nude, and he, yeah, he can play bishop takes g5, but what does that have to do with the position? Okay, and when knight takes g6 comes into play, then queen h5 is possible. Or there's a very strong secondary threat of rook h6 in this position. That's a very strong threat. Rook h6, how is he going to defend g6? That's the question. So we go on. What did he play at this point? He played, of course, the most computer-like move, bishop d6. No human would play that move because it interferes with the advance of the d-pawn. But it does allow the queen to become a defender on g5. So it does have some logic behind it, even though it interferes with development. And it threatens to get rid of white's attacking knight on e5. But here came one of my favorite moves of the game. The jump development move, which is queen c2. And here are some of the pretty lines that could have followed. If he plays bishop takes in this position, after queen c2, he plays queen takes g5. But if he played bishop takes e5, queen takes g6, check. Bishop g7, only move. And now, how would white continue? Queen h7, check. Now, g6 check. And here's a little more to this that's worth seeing. Okay. Now, if king e7, queen takes g7. So he plays king e8. Okay, it's a better move. Because now rook h8 would be pretty strong. But so would queen to h8 is a beautiful move, threatening g7, is absolutely devastating. Rook takes h8, rook takes h8, king g7, king e7, g7. Absolutely devastating theme, which is, you've never seen, I don't think, anything like this. So the queen h8 move comes up a few times, but the better move is king to e8, not king to e7. Queen takes g7. And now, if queen f6, then we can trade. And we can play rook h8 check and push. That would be pretty much winning. Or king e7 and push, and white has all the chances. Okay, here. The bishop's hanging, not to mention that white could just play rook takes c8 and be up the exchange. So that's all winning for white. Instead, if he plays queen e7 in this line, after queen h7 check, king f7, g6 check, king e8, queen takes g7, queen e7, now comes again queen h8. The stunning queen h8 with the threat g7 and again the variation would go rook takes h8 rook takes h8 check king f8 queen f8 g7 unbelievable and black can resign i don't think you will have seen anything like this one, one thing that really struck me when i was trying to uh, study this game a little bit to prepare and looking at these lines is that material is not everything. And this is something that I see a lot when I, you know, I, I, I work with beginners and, and whatnot. You know, material is relative. And even though black has a lot of extra pieces, they're all stuck on the queen side. They're completely out of play and um, pretty much irrelevant to the position. Yeah, yeah. This game, you know, obviously sticks out for me because it's uh, like a game from the time of Morphe. You know, Black will end in some lines ends up with a rook, two knights, and a bishop on the queen side that are not doing anything.
So anyway, he did not play bishop takes e5. He played queen takes g5. And by the way, we're about half done with the game at this point. So the natural move that I had in mind against this was knight e4, tempo. And we're forking, and with, you know, the queen, if she wants to save the bishop, then there's problems with knight takes g6, or even rook h8 check might be good, but knight g6 looks simply better. If queen to e7, knight g6, why not? Okay, that looks winning. So, he plays the natural queen takes g2. And now, I play the very natural move that I had been planning, Castles Long. And basically, uh, I see two open files to the Black King. The G-Pawn is a very thin defender to the Black King. Uh, you know, the deep rook is coming to the G-File. We have two knights. And he plays bishop takes E5. And I obviously, I had to calculate everything here and work it out very, very deeply. So he plays bishop takes E5. And I had originally planned to just recapture with all the threats pending. But I have to admit that I could not find a win in this position after rook f4. And I tried knight g3. But again, I could not win against rook g4. I could not see a definite win. And if uh, a few moves back, if knight f6 check after rook f4, I think he just takes it. And he, can play, he has time to bring his queen back with check and defend. Queen g5 check, and I think he defends. So, this is sad. <laughs> I'm now down, if you take a look at this position, I'm down three pieces. Have you ever been down three pieces? For two years, I've been down, I'm going to be down three pieces. <laughs> I'd better be calculating well. And I played... You know, I, according to my convictions, I played rook on d to g1. And I see that there's a nice easy win if queen f3 in this position, the most crushing move is knight d6. A clearance move for the queen on c2. And that would be the end. He has no way defending the threats on g6 coupled with other threats, okay? The, you know, just no way for black to defend everything. Instead, he makes the correct decision now over Lorenz and black. He plays check. I'm sorry. Four, <laughs> Bishop at four check first, that's right. Yeah, he, he gives the check. Because, obviously, he always plays the most greedy move first, which is to keep his three pieces, as we've seen. Go ahead and play king b1. And now he takes the correct move, rook, to his credit. You would think that taking the g rook was wrong because, you know, I'm going to have the g rook to, again to attack the weakness on g6. But it turns out that the real win is via the H file, as you'll see in a few moves. And if he had taken the H rook, the win would have been that a little easier. Okay, that's just the point. That it's hard to defend G6, and rook H7 check will be strong. So he takes the G rook. And I take rook takes G1, and naturally he plays king F7. Now is the first time since the attack started, which was way back around, you know, before move 10 when we started sacrificing, and now we're on move 20, 
21, where I take a breather and I stop sacrificing. <laughs> I realize that the queen, you can't win this game without the queen. If black's pieces get out, if he gets to play knight c6, b5, or d6, and his pieces get out, the game's over. He's up a chess set, as my dear late friend Carl Berger used to say. He had a joke. He said, I played Arnold Denker three times, and three times Arnold Denker gave me a chess set. And by that he meant Arnold Denker gave away his pieces. And it looks like White is giving away his pieces too here, so he better get some more action, and he better get the queen closer to the black king, or black's going to slip away. And every move here has to be very precise. So the next move is knight c3. A quiet move. For the first time in ten moves, I take one breather. And of course, he has to play rook g8. Only move to defend. Now, interesting, if black plays g5 in that position, then white has the attacking themes that work with knight to e2 to get rid of the key defender again and get the rook and queen coordinated. Okay, that's difficult for black to defend this position as well. Coupled with queen h7 check, queen h5 check, the black king is never comfortable and his rook on f8 will be hanging if the king goes too far away. So black finds it very hard to coordinate his pieces. Important little detail here is if black plays knight c6, in a lot of positions white gets a very strong d5 with tempo. Not right here, but in similar positions, okay? So d5 delays black's development further. Not, I'm not talking about this exact position, but it's a very strong tempo that prevents black from normalizing his play. And it turns out that white's pawns have to be worth a piece. At least one of his pawns must be worth a piece. Otherwise, white is indeed losing materially. We go back to the game, please. Rook g8. After knight c3, queen e4. Tempo. The queen jumps into the game with tempo. Okay, very good. Excellent. So... Queen e4 is that tempo move which allows the queen and knight and rook to work together again. And as we said, black would not be comfortable with g5 because a knight e2 moves like that and queen e h7 check is threatened and so on. So, you know, knight takes and queen h7 and so on. So black plays bishop d6 again. Not very good for development, but he does need the bishop around the king to defend. It's that simple. So he plays bishop d6, and now we play a very surprising move. I only told you that I'd take a break from sacrificing for a split second. Now comes knight d5. And I'm proud of this move. We're sacrificing again. And there's a serious threat to get materialistic with queen f3 check. And then that wins more material, wins a rook, and continues to attack after queen f3 check. So there's a serious threat here. But let's look at if he takes the knight. Now, if you want to see a fantasy variation, it would go like this. Queen takes d5 check. King to g7, rook takes g6 check, king takes rook, queen takes g8 check, king moves to maybe f6, queen takes c8. Now, black has three pieces and a rook for the queen. And I would call this position somewhat unclear. This is not white's best. So that's why I call it a fantasy variation. Still, the pawns have to be worth at least a piece for this to be competitive. And there is a threat of queen to b7 
and there's also threats of C5, B5, all kinds of things. C5 first, you know, black is not comfortable because that whole queen side is undeveloped. But let's go back to reality. So it, 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 the real move after knight d5, pawn takes knight, queen takes d5, check, king g7 is simply queen takes d6. And the attack goes on. Or we can say the beat goes on. And black is still under duress. If he plays king f7 now, then white plays the familiar rook lift. Rook g3, and the beat goes on. As I said, black is not comfortable. Even though he has a rook and three pieces for a queen. So we go back to the game. And we're getting there. Knight <laughs> d5, bishop e7. And strangely enough, I calculated that the best move here is simply to take away black's key defender, which is that bishop on e7. Queen f4 check, king to e8, knight takes e7, king takes e7. It's very strange that we're trading off because we are still down a rook and three pieces for a queen. But... Now comes the next phase of the attack. Queen g5 check. That's just to be precise. We want to know the address of the black king. If the black king goes to f7, then we can play a move like rook f3 or rook h1. That's going to be nasty. Okay? Those type of moves are going to cause a lot of trouble. So he goes to e8. And we, after e8, you know, in chess, you have to think about what your opponent wants to do. And we know that black wants to play d5, d6, either one of those moves, knight c6, and get his pieces back to the center, develop, and protecting his king. So we do exactly what prevents him from doing that, from accomplishing d5 or knight c6 or d6 with effect. So we play d5 ourselves. An acute line here is it now if black plays d6, hoping to play e takes d5 and bishop f5 check, which would get him out of the, the woods, white has a nice line now that he just plays rook h1. Quiet move. Threatening rook h7. And if black plays pawn takes d5, white did not promise that he was going to h7. He can change his mind. And he can play rook e1 check. And that will lead indeed to mate. King d7. Rook e7 check. I don't think he wants to walk into a discovery. I don't know which is better. Queen takes d5 check, king g6, queen b5 mate. So you could say it's not important how many pieces you have, but what they're doing. So d5, and black now cannot really develop his queen side. And don't forget, rook h1 is still the threat, coupled with rook h7. So he plays knight c5. Thank goodness that's inconsequential. Just moves a piece into the game but doesn't threaten anything. And we threaten mate. What better than to threaten mate in one? Knight c6. And we say, okay, I must take one piece now. Queen takes c5. Now the material is closer, but we're not mating black. And he's still not developed, and the threat is queen g5, rook h1, rook h7, rook e7, check, and mate will follow. That is the threat. So b6 is too slow. b6, 
Queen G5, Bishop B7, Rook H1, and White will win. Don't forget, Black can't castle. <laughs> So in the game, he tried a5 here. Yeah, he's trying to come in the back door with his rook. And that allows, thank goodness, for some pretty variations that did not happen. But we, I must share with you, because I don't think you will have ever seen this kind of mate possibly occur in a real game. So he plays a5. I mean, you might almost suggest that I made up this game. That's how spectacular and unusual, I think this is. Queen G5. A4. He's going to try to bring the rook in from the A file, which is very unusual. Rook H. Okay, Queen G5, Rook H1. Now, if Rook A5. C5. We shut the rook down. B6. Rook H7. Rook takes C5. Rook E7 check. If King F8, Queen F6 mate. And if King D8, here we have the spectacular and never before seen in real play, I think, Minimalist mate. Rook g7 check. Rook takes queen. Rook takes rook mate. Back to basics. But this did not happen. <laughs> the game ended more mundanely. So I think instead of rook to a5 here after rook h1, he played king to f7. Correct. So he, was, he was trying to run away with the king. Right. And I played rook h7 check. Rook g7. And rook h8. And believe me, I was looking for better than this, but this was the best I could find. And what's interesting here, again is that white must use everything in this position to win. Everything meaning the C-pawn, the F-pawn, they both are part of the winning process to terminate the game. So, he plays E5 now. A worthy try. If he had played Rook A5, again, I would have had to play C5, threatening queen to f4 check, and this could be kind of transpositional. Now if he plays e5, you play f4. And if he takes on c5, lucky me, I have f5. Just makes it. Threatening f6, and threatening pawn takes g6 check. I think f6 is the real nasty move. Okay. But if, if he plays e4, then you would take on g6 check because you can win the rook on c5 as well. And don't forget the bishop on c8 is also hanging. So black doesn't have much of a game here. He's just surviving, stopping me. But it is interesting to me that white needs to use both the c-pawn and the f-pawn to consummate his attack. So... In this position, after rook h8, he plays e5, I play f4, and if he takes, you take queen takes f4 check, king e6, and basically rook e8 is mate. As good as mate. So, Mr. Lorenzen plays rook g8. I play rook takes g8, and he nicely here finally resigns. But it's not particularly generous, because I'm making a new queen, and I'm mating. Rook king takes, and now I could push f5 or take on g6. I like pushing. No, I, uh, yeah, I like pushing right away, and the pawn is going to come up the board, 
and threaten mate and also help make a new queen and black can't stop it. So that's why he was correct to resign in these positions. So it's a pretty interesting game. I, I couldn't help but look, uh, you know, the, they always say there's three different ways to evaluate a, a position. Uh, I guess they say material, position, and time. And so when you look at this game, you got to think that material really isn't everything, uh, especially not when you're talking about your king, especially when you talk about development. You know, he was up, how many pieces he had, he had on the, the side of the board, you know, for most of the game on the queen's side, he had two knights, a bishop and a rook. And they really had no impact on the game. And meanwhile, just with a queen and rook, uh, just making too many threats against his king. Yeah, I mean, the, the number one in chess has to be your king. And development often helps to attack the king. So I, I, you're right on. The development and the fact that he never really had a safe king. I mean, the onslaught... I think he castled too early. I think castles, in the, you know, in the, the opening, he castled right into it. And I think that's a mistake right there, castling right there. I think it's better to, for black in that position to play d5 and knight b d7 and delay castling a bit longer. Once you know the address of the black king, you can hunt him down and you can target him with your bishops, your queen, everybody can aim at the black king in a position like that. And the move knight d5, as you pointed out, Will, really breaks the rules. Taking a piece away from the king, moving it twice in the opening, and he had to pay a price for that. And don't forget how many times that knight later moved. It moved to d5, to b4, to a6, to c5, before it was finally taken. Time is definitely an element in chess. One thing computers have proven in chess is that material is the single most important factor in chess. But so is the king. I mean, you've got to take care of the king. It's up to the viewers to decide. Do you think that Black was using a computer when he played this game? <laughs> Well, we'll definitely look forward to seeing those comments. Uh, I think that'll do it for us today. Uh, Dr. Kopeck, I definitely appreciate you taking the time uh, to, uh, you know, send us this game and, and explain everything to us. And um, to all our viewers out there, definitely keep an eye out as we are going to be releasing some free previews of Dr. Kopeck's uh, extensive video collection and also looking forward to putting those up uh, in the online chesslessons.net shop. So I, I definitely appreciate it, Danny. It's been a great pleasure, Will, and I look forward to working with you a lot more. All right. Take care, Danny. Have yourself a good night. Good night.